To put it bluntly, if Akasha and Enkil should ever walk hand in hand into a furnace, we should all burn with them. Crush them to blittering dust, and we are annihilated. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Now that quote I just read out was from the novel The Queen of the Damned, the third installment of the Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice. If you're wondering why everyone would be annihilated if Akasha and Enkil walked into a furnace, well that's down to the fact that these two were the very first vampires to exist. Actually Akasha was. Enkil however was her first fledgling but still quite powerful. Now I've spent close to a full week every single day reading the Queen of the Damned book in an effort to properly structure this video and for those of you who haven't read it, the chapters are laid out unusually and it's not exactly the easiest book to take notes on as the chapters go back and forth between different characters perspectives. Anyway what I'm trying to say is if you enjoy this video then I'd really appreciate you all giving it a thumbs up to support me. Now Akasha the Great Mother, the Queen of Kemet, the Queen of all Vampires, the Queen of the Damned. Akasha's journey stems back 6,000 years ago and she is without a doubt the oldest living being in existence by a long shot. She has an incredibly unique and interesting story and despite the prep for this video taking a seriously long time to do, the end product I hope will deliver justice on this amazing character and main antagonist from the Queen of the Damned novel. Let's begin. Akasha is the very first vampire to ever exist, along with her husband Enkil. To make it short and sweet, that means every single vampire currently in existence stems back to her. They are all linked back to the Queen. As of the book's timeline, neither Akasha nor Enkil have been active in over 50 centuries, remaining in an inanimate state and having their bodies taken care of by the vampire Marius. Because of their apparent lifeless state and the many superstitions that surrounded the importance of their well-being for the sake of the vampire race, the king and queen became known as those who must be kept. Their story did circulate but with no real concrete truth behind it. Many vampires looked upon it as just another myth. However, I can assure you it was indeed far from a myth. There is a story to be told, a story that can explain it all. When it comes to the Queen of the Damned, there's an answer for everything. So let's go back, let's go back 6,000 years ago to a time before vampires, when Akasha was a human. Let's go back to a time when there were no pyramids, no mummies and Egypt was known as the Kingdom of Kemet. King Enkil had just come to power and needed a queen. Akasha was his chosen suitor and travelled from her own ancient city of Uruk, now modern day Iraq, to become his bride. It's also noteworthy to mention that she would never have been considered for queen if Enkil had a sister to marry, as was the custom to keep the bloodline pure and have no other challenge to the throne. At first, Akasha and Enkil were beloved rulers. They wanted to do good and their first act was to guide their people far away from the act of cannibalism and instead turn to farming. This resonated extremely well with their people as while cannibalism was becoming outdated, they were the first rulers to enforce the restrictions on consuming human flesh. However, despite the majority in favour of banning cannibalism, Ancient tribes who had practiced ritual cannibalism for funerals were outraged that their traditions had now been eradicated. The new king and queen then issued a decree that dead bodies must now be offered to the earth and wrapped in linens before being placed inside of tombs. Once again this caused a stir in the minorities as more traditions were now being banned and replaced. After some time however, Enkil and Akasha's reasoning that the spirits of the dead would fare better with the body still intact and uneaten seemed to become widely accepted. The results of this acceptance then resulted in the practice of mummification being part of the reason why Egypt is so famous today. Eventually Enkil built an army and embarked on conquests north and south of the land, uniting his unhappy kingdom under one goal and one regime, which was greatly effective. 
Akasha and Enkil worshipped gods like Osiris and Ra, amongst many other animal gods, gods of which are widely known today from studies of ancient Egypt. However, it is later revealed by Maharet that these gods were actually spirits who created and played the roles of all of these powerful entities, but I'll go into that a little later in the video. Though having good intentions at the beginning of their reign, Akasha and Enkil slowly become corrupt and showed no guilt for the bloodshed spilt by Enkil's great militia campaign, despite trying to steer their people away from violence at the beginning. Akasha became heavily interested in spirits and desired to know more. When she and Enkil had heard of the witch twins Maharet and Makara, they invited them to court in order to witness their great power for themselves, as no witch had ever left their family home since their family's existence, in addition to being warned that the king and queen were evil and would be extremely unhappy with the results from the twins' powers. They refused the offer, and so the Kometa messenger returned empty-handed. Furious at the twins refusal, Akasha then sends soldiers back to the twins village, with them arriving at the same time of their mother's funeral. The twins were actually warned by the spirits that strangers were coming a second time, but did not see it as a threat due to the high number of visitors they had, wanting to witness their powers. The soldiers slaughtered everyone in the village before the twins and arrested them for the crime of cannibalism. Enkil stepped forward, the king himself making the journey and advised his men not to fear the spirit's wrath as the gods of Kemet would protect them. Maharet and Makar were dragged to Kemet against a will, despite Enkil assuring them that they were under his protection. When the party arrives at Kemet, the twins settle into their quarters before being brought to court to speak with the king and queen. Akasha informs them that flesh eating is outlawed, forbidden, that only savages practice cannibalism and the people of the village were shown mercy by being killed quickly. She follows up with stating that they are fortunate to be alive but for their powers. The truth is, is that Akasha was angered to such a point due to the girl's refusal of her initial offer that she had the people of the village killed in order to have the girls at her mercy. Maharet's firm belief was that Akasha wanted to shape the world in her image in order to comfort herself. Akasha began asking the twins question after question. How did they work their miracles? How did they look into the hearts of men? Why did they claim to talk to beings who were invisible? Akasha was willing to pardon the twins in exchange for them fully embracing the Egyptian culture, their gods, their beliefs and also, most importantly, to lay down their knowledge and accept Akasha as their queen. Makara spoke in revolt to her however when she said, You have no gods in this kingdom because there are no gods. The only invisible inhabitants of this world are spirits. They play with you between your priests and religions as they play with everyone else. Ra, Osiris, these are merely made up names in which you flatter and court the spirits and when it suits their purposes they give you some little sign to send you scurrying to flatter them some more. Akasha looked on in horror at the woman who was verbally deconstructing everything she and her husband believe in. The queen continues to listen as Makara states that she has not come here to lie. She has not come here willingly at all, that the manner in which she and her sister were taken before court is pure evil. Akasha then threw the twins into a cell after an outcry from her high priests to execute them as had long been the custom with red haired twins. The next morning the twins had been brought before the king and queen once again where Akasha began with her questions once again. This time Makara summoned the spirits to prove to Akasha that they were real and her gods were not. At first Akasha was taken back in fear of what she was seeing but then became convinced that these spirits were nothing more than weak tricks. She reconfirmed her loyalty to her own gods and condemned the twins as blasphemers. Akasha demanded this spirit Amel come forward and show itself, and come forward it did. Amel covered the queen in tiny cuts as she screamed in horror. The spirit loved the taste of blood. It was a euphoric feeling though, it could only do so much without a solid form. The twins were sent back to their cell where they were left for three days before being brought to the atrium for an audience with the king and queen 
for a third time. Akasha decided to release the twins, but not without a public display of them having no power. Enkil then instructed his most trusted guard, Cayman, to rape each twin in order to strip them both of their honour. Because of their horrific actions, Amel then began haunting and tormenting the king, queen and Cayman, eventually driving the three of them insane. As Amel continued his daily torture, the nobles, who were still in favour of ritual cannibalism, followed the king and queen to Cayman's home and fatally stabbed Akasha and Enkil multiple times, leaving them both to die. As Akasha's soul leaves her body, Amel clings to it, he snatches it and intertwines it with his own spirit and re-enters Akasha's body, rapidly healing her and creating the first ever vampire of which the lust for human blood comes from Amel's original craving for the substance. Now, a spirit has joined with the soul and fully occupies human flesh, something never thought possible. What has become of me? She said as she looked at her wounds healing rapidly. Akasha then quickly tended to a dying Enkil, cutting herself and guiding the blood into his open wounds as they healed before her. She then smeared the blood everywhere, his face, his mouth, and after tasting one drop of his queen's blood, Enkil rose up and drank from Akasha, becoming the second ever vampire and the first fledgling. After they became vampires, Enkil became somewhat of a consort to Akasha. She never looked at him as her equal despite becoming a queen because of him. Akasha and Enkil could read the minds of anyone with whom they wished. They had superhuman strength, superhuman speed, but with that came an insatiable thirst for blood. Their sensitivity to sunlight led them to believe that the sun god Ra had forsaken them and wanted to punish them at every chance possible, meaning the king and queen could now only go out at night. Akasha and Enkil's first act is to track and kill the nobles who try to assassinate them to begin with. They do so with relative ease. However, she wants to know how she came to be, why she came to be, and sends Cayman once again to retrieve the twins and answer her questions. Maharet explains to Akasha that the evil spirit Amel is now inhabiting her body and is too large to be contained in one singular human form. The spirit and their bloodlust will be proportionally diluted as more humans are made into vampires. However, as the bloodlust continues to overwhelm Akasha and Enkil, the queen decides that Maharet's explanation is unsatisfactory and sentences both her and Makara to execution, having Maharet's eyes removed and Makara's tongue amputated beforehand. Cayman, who had been turned into a vampire by Akasha and still furious over it, then changes Makara into a vampire who in turn changes Maharet. Over the coming weeks and months, Enkil and Akasha battled with Cayman, Makara and Maharet and the additional vampires they made, known as the First Brood. Akasha succeeds in capturing the twins and encases them both in stone coffins, sending Makara to the east of the planet and Maharet to the west by means of the ocean. As Maharet correctly predicted, the more vampires that were created, the more Akasha and Enkil's bloodlust decreased. They attempted to pass themselves off as gods so they could both be worshipped and cared for. However, after some time, mortals soon found out that immortality could be taken from them by consuming their blood. The wars Akasha and Enkil were hoping to forgo erupted in full force and vampires were created in the hundreds, possibly thousands with two men factions, those who hoped to use their supernatural gifts for some kind of greater good and those who would use the same abilities in a destructive or harmful manner. Both factions seen times of success and times of failure. At some point during this war, Akasha and Enkil were captured and contained in diorite prison cages. Diorite on a par or possibly harder than granite, leaving only their heads and necks exposed. This way they could both take victims and be easily robbed of their own ancient and most powerful blood. They were rendered incapable of escaping, defending themselves or even destroying themselves, thus taking the rest of their race with them into death. 
They spend centuries in this state and in defiance of their captors, they then refuse to feed from victims. This kept their blood from growing very much in strength but also robbed them of the strength needed if they were to ever escape. They became living statues with skin that appeared the texture of marble. As Akasha and Enkil are the very first vampires, anything that happens to them will therefore affect all current vampires in existence, which means their bodies must be kept safe, kept preserved, therefore they became those who must be kept. After centuries had passed, one night they were discovered to have broken free of their prisons. Their clothing having long ago wasted away, they lay naked, embracing one another on the floor, though they remained in their lifeless state. As they were believed to be the core of the race, nobody wanted to risk any harm coming to them, and several vampires took on the task of caring for them. Over time, caretakers would find them as having moved or having interacted with their environment in some way. When Marius de Romanus was their keeper, he once told us that that he would often find doors or windows of their various sanctuaries open, even though no one could have opened them except him or another extremely powerful vampire. He also recounted how Akasha used her mental powers to repeatedly break a necklace he donned her with, until Marius finally realised that she didn't like it. Before Marius however, there was another keeper one who wanted to test the old superstitions of every vampire being linked back to Akasha and Enkil. This person was known as the Elder. One night, the Elder moved the two out onto the banks of the Nile, forcing them to face the morning sun. Their bodies simply bronzed, but the effect on vampires across the world was catastrophic. The youngest born vampires spontaneously combusted, while the older ones suffered severe burns and were weakened greatly. Marius arrived in Egypt to investigate what had happened and came across the Elder and his mistreatment of the King and Queen. When threatening to expose Akasha and Enkil to the sun once again, Akasha became reanimated and destroyed the Elder, which in turn made Marius the new keeper. They would spend the next 2000 years under his care and protection and they would be moved from one sanctuary to another over the centuries. Just as Marius protected them, so would Akasha protect him when occasions proved capable for her to do so. The Elder would not be the only one wishing to test the boundaries of the King and Queen. Maharet returns to see just how powerful the connection was for herself. She drove a dagger into Akasha's heart and immediately felt her own heart stop beating. Desiring to live over extracting vengeance, Maharet begrudgingly left the two in peace. By 1985, with so many technological advances in existence, like the ability to see the sun in movies and television, Marius hoped it would wake Akasha and Enkil, but to his great disappointment, still they remained inanimate. That was until Akasha heard Lestat's music from its newly formed rock band, The Vampire Lestat. In Akasha's mind, she initially wanted to do good and was intrigued with Lestat wanting to reveal vampires to the world, no longer wanting their secrets hidden. She found purpose once again to pull herself from her inanimate slumber, however she did not have the strength to fully regain her power, therefore she used the only thing she could think of for a resource, her consort Enkil. Akasha drained him of every last drop of blood before killing him, finally putting an end to their 6,000 year reign as king and queen. She goes to Lestat's rock concert and kidnaps him, making him her new consort. Akasha tells him that many vampires all over the world would have been destroyed, but the people he cares for have been spared. She then teaches him how to use his greater vampiric powers that he now has after drinking from her again. Akasha then takes Lestat to the temple that was created by another vampire named Azim to be worshipped by the humans that live there. Akasha kills this vampire and then proceeds to start killing all the men in the temple. She asks for Lestat's help in this task and although Lestat is very reluctant to do so, he eventually joins in with the massacre and finds that he actually enjoys it. She then takes the stat to other cities and repeats the killings, but Lestat does not join in this time. He tries to reason with her and persuade her against killing almost the entire male population, but she doesn't listen to him. 
The surviving vampires are confronted by Akasha in Maharet's Sanama compound. She explains her plans for her to be the new god of the world and offers the vampires a chance to be her followers as angels in her new world order. Akasha plans to kill 90% of the world's human men and to establish a new Eden in which women will worship Akasha as a goddess. They all refuse to partake in Akasha's plan despite her vow to destroy them all if they do not comply. Maharaj speaks for all of them when she boldly says that Akasha simply wants to dominate and be worshipped and have everybody obey her no matter how many lives are lost. The refusal makes Akasha furious. But before she can destroy the surviving vampires, Makar, whom no one has seen for 6,000 years, appears in the room. She charges at Akasha, shoving her into a glass wall, causing a large shard to decapitate her. Just as doom is spelled out for all vampires, Makar devours both the brain and heart of Akasha, taking into herself the sacred core which contains the spirit of Amel. Successfully bonding with the Sacred Core, Makar becomes the new Queen of all Vampires, the Queen of the Damned, while Akasha's body becomes a transparent shell. So I'll leave it there everyone, well I have to as I've nothing left to talk about when it comes to this intriguing, amazing character. No part 2 coming up, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, please make sure to subscribe as this video took a very long time to make. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.